I'm Raj. So I'm the uh, dev lead of the REFS team at Microsoft. Um, REFS, OK. Um, let's see. So here's kind of the outline of the agenda for today. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about REFS v1, what we did um, for v2, the various features of REFS um, v2, the motivations, and a few of those features. So I'm going to focus on those features which enabled us to support shingle SMR drives natively on REFS. And then, of course, there are other things that, that we needed to do uh, for SMR in REFS. So what is REFS? So REFS v1, it's a allocate on write file system. Uh, we shipped in 2012. Um, so we use B plus tables as our on-disk on metadata structures. Uh, we use Merkle tree to verify metadata integrity. That's always enabled. Uh, the, it's optional for data. We do not, so unlike many other file, similar file systems in this space, we require both data and metadata integrity turned on by default. We actually made it optional so that somebody, there are applications which do data integrity validation on top, so they do not need to pay for the validation at two layers. Um, so that was on, that was optional. So one of the things that REFS v1 did was, um, so if you if you if you are running on a resilient volume, you've got multiple copies. If you read one copy, one copy gets corrupt. Not only so we we are smart enough to read from alternate copy, and if the alternate copy is good, we'll actually write back uh, to the corrupted copy and fix it. So that's one. So we automatically deleted all of our code paths which read things from the desk. Did this. So, but uh, if you are running on a system on which there's been massive amount of corruption, none of the copies are good, or you actually have, uh, are, you're not running on a um, redundant system, a corruption essentially means you're losing some data. So normally data or some files or directories. Normally on NTFS, you actually need to, need to run an offline tool called uh, CheckDesk um, to fix the corruption and bring the volume back up. In REFS, we actually do it inline. So in, in other words, when an IO come, or any operation, top level operation comes down, it encounters corruption, it goes, it calls into a special part of the file system which says, I encountered this corruption, can you please fix it? And the file system looks at it, fixes the corruption, which might result in the file or directory actually getting deleted. And then the operation resumes and like for example, uh, let's say you try to open a file, the file was corrupted, REFS will internally remove, delete that file, and then resume that operation, and at that point it'll say, oh, I couldn't find that file. Like, file not found. Things like that. Uh, so, but only for the namespace that has been corrupted. So other, other file system operations are completely unaffected by that. So you never have to take your volume down to do this. So it happens, sure. What happens if you have edited corruption? So it's both data and metadata. So it, it, this is actually mostly metadata corruption, because remember, the only time you can validate Unless you have... When I said metadata, I sure. meant like file system critical. Yes. <laughs> Good question. So we do have mechanisms to recover a majority of, recover from majority of our file system metadata, critical metadata corruption. Like for example, let's say one of the uh, very big important uh, metadata, uh, metadata in a file system is essentially the allocator, right, which is storing the free and, and, and uh, allocated regions on the disk. So if it gets corrupted, what we do is we essentially triage out the corrupted regions from that material table and insert as if it's all allocated. So it, it loses some storage, it leaks some storage, but it's back into a consistent state. Now, we actually have a tool that we'll be shipping sh with RS3, the next release, which will be able to identify this kind of leaks and fix it. Later on, so you can, you, as, you, as your volume has gotten corruptions and stuff like that, you'll see your usable space, free space, has decreased, and then you can run the tool and get it all, get it all back. And then there is, of course, the case of latent corruptions, where let's say you have got a huge data set, and that data set, most of it is is cold. Now, because you can have bit flips on, on media, um, you might not discover it. So let's say if you have a 
if you are on a mirror and one of the bits flip, if you don't discover it quickly enough, the other side might also flip, and then you have a data loss. So we actually have a scrubbing logic in REFS v1, which essentially will grovel through the whole namespace uh, in the background to fix um, this kind of single copy corruptions. So this is v1. With, so in 2016, we shipped REFS v2. So it took all the parts of REFS v1, all of the things that have features that I talked about, and then it added a few more, quite a few more functionality to the file system. And we add, so many of the features that we added were essentially more geared towards server-focused workloads. So we tried to solve the problem that many of the server, large-scale server applications were having. So one of the things, like for example, if you have a parity disk, right, you're running a parity disk, one of the main problems with parity is that if you have to do small writes on the parity, somebody has to do read, modify, write on that parity stripe. And actually, because of the write whole problem, they actually most probably have to log all of, all of your writes on a separate log and then slowly destage because it can crash at any point of time. So REFS, for example, in this kind of scenarios, uh, in this kind of configuration, configurations, can actually do always full parity writes. And the way we can do, the reason we can do that is because it's more applicable to, for example, if you have a tiered volume, where you have a mirror tier and a parity tier. So you write your initial data on the mirror tier, and then when the data becomes cold or whatever other policies you think of, you can actually take the whole stripe and write it onto the, um, <coughs> the parity tier. So there's no, uh, so it doesn't need to be written into a log. It can be destaged directly. And I'll go into how we can do that. So other thing we did is dynamic tiering in IO code path. So this is tiered volumes. So on a tiered volume, you have got, let's say, and this is very applicable for virtualized Hyper-V workloads, uh, virtualized workloads. So you have got a large data set. You've got very large files, which are VHDs. Only a small portion of those VHDs are actually getting access, read, or written at any point of time. Now, if you think about it, you can put all of those VHDs on SSDs, right, on, on fast media, and then that's great, right? But then you are actually not using your media. Most of the time, you're, you're wasting storage. Like, you have this fast storage is not getting access. So tiering, uh, the tiering configuration, so in tiered mode, RDFS actually does. So RDFS v1 actually did support tiering. But it did it in a, in a bit of a reactive way rather than proactive. Uh, let me tell you what, what I mean by that. So all I.O. that, all data allocations for data usually used to go into the slow tier. As the I.O.s came along and we found out there's a heat mapper or heat detector engine inside REFS, once we found out that this region of, of that file has become hot, we'll move that extent of that file to, to the fast tier. Now, this is reactive, and for very dynamic workloads, this used to be very, very slow. So in REFS v2, we did dynamic tiering. So what it means is, it doesn't matter where you are allocated, where the IO write comes down, if we find that you are going to be writing to the slow tier, we'll actually inline reallocate into the fast tier. And because of the efficiencies we achieved out of other parts of the file system, we can do that at a very high rate to the point where the application does not, see, it sees a bit of, so bit of degradation, but it's, it's, it's almost not noticeable. And remember, this is only for the data that used to go into the slow tier, it's moving in the fast tier. Once it's fast tier, then you can access it, the, access it as, as, not, as many times as you want, and no uh, file system doesn't come into the picture anymore. This is only for ingestion. Another thing that uh, RFS v1 didn't have and we had to add it was the redo logging. Um, because of the write throughs, most of our uh, server workloads were using write through IOs. So, and that was pretty painful in RFS v1. Uh, I have a sure. Do you guys do both, do you guys support both tiering and caching? The secondary media? Or? 
Yes, so we have got something called a read cache. So tiering, if you can think about it, tiering is for writes. How can I make writes faster? So it's essentially trying to capture the write workload. Now the write working set is not necessarily the same as the read working set. And the read working set, if it is, if it is, um, if it's different from the write, you can of course put it in the, the into the write, uh, sorry, the fast here. But the problem is on the resilient volume, you you have got triple mirrors. So you are you are essentially wasting your some of your capacity of your uh, of your uh, SSD by keeping three copies of or something that is just for performance. So we have a separate read cache which essentially identifies the reads that are coming out of the uh, hard drive and it will actually uh, cache it in a separate single tier, single um, single uh, flash tier with a, sing a single resiliency so that you do not uh, waste any. Well, technically speaking, you could also use tiering for reads. So basically, that Now, yeah, so yes, we could. The problem here is that in the configurations that we run, our write tier is almost always 100% full. <laughs> so, so it's 100% full. So if I put anything in there, I'm actually stealing IOPS away from the writes. So what are the other things that RFS V2 had? So, so it had a sparse VDL logic, which essentially means in metadata, REFS will actually know which part of the of a file has been written and what hasn't. The reason this this was actually important from many of the Hyper-V scenarios where VHDs, there's large zeroing that happens on regions of the VHD. And in many other file systems, what will happen is that this will actually send down a huge number of zero writes to, to media. So we call it logical zeroing, so all they need to do is essentially they flip some bits in our metadata, we know this, is, this has been written or not. So the moment it becomes logically zeroed, no IOs go to the disk. It's only recorded in meta metadata, and when read happens, we already know, oh, okay, this is, this uninitialized just returns zeros. So it's actually very, very, it actually speeded up quite a few scenarios of for VM provisioning um, on RFS. So another thing that we did was uh, file-level snapshots. So these are writable file-level snapshots. You can take a file and you can snap it. And you get another copy of that file. It's like, think of it as a very, very fast copying of a file. So it's happening completely with metadata without any data uh, being exchanged or being written, read or written from the disk. Now interestingly, this API is actually far more generic than, it can be used as a file-level snapshot API, but it actually is a far more generic API which essentially did something like this. Given a file and given a range in this file, project whatever the data of that range is onto this range of this file or and disjoint range within the same file. Interestingly, like for example, and we, many of our uh, deployments actually are uh, workloads running on REFS, actually have found very interesting uses for it. So one of them I'll describe, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's, it's the Azure stack, which is essentially creating a blob service. So blobs are essentially big chunks of data that uh, somebody puts onto the file system. Now, the thing here is uh, Windows Azure actually allows you to update a blob. How do you do it atomically? Because if you do a write, you might fail in between. So what they do is, so when somebody updates a blob, they will actually write to a log. Once that log has been written and everything has been uh, stabilized, they will actually use this API to move this chunk of this log, which is again another file, to this chunk of this other file. And it's atomic, either it fails or it succeeds. And this is Azure Stack, which is essentially Microsoft private cloud solution, which uses that to give the same kind of blob interface that Azure, the public cloud does. Uh, RDFS has multi-stream support. It had multi-stream support since 2016. 2000, yeah, or it was the first release. Yeah, I think we got it in by 2016. Um, so another thing that we did for RDFS V2 is it's not apparent from, it didn't give us any top level advantage in terms of features, but it made many of this functionality that I'm talking about. 
uh, it made them, uh, I, sh I should say, implementable, uh, we actually redesigned our allocators in, in our FSV2, and I'll explain you what we did. So, and I'll go into what that enabled us to do later on when we needed to tackle the SMR. So in RFS V1, so allocation, having a very fast allocation, is actually the bread and butter of a copy and write file system. Right? You're allocating like crazy. So how did RFS V1 achieve, the, achieve that? So what we did was essentially we had multiple allocators, hierarchical allocators. We had a large allocator, medium allocator, small allocator, and then we had, they had like literally thousands of private allocators in hierarchy. Each one of them can act independently as long as it has enough storage in itself, describes itself. But when it runs out of it, it goes to its next parent. Next parent. It's all great. So all of our allocation logic could run in parallel, and that's how we used to get performance. The problem with that kind of approach is there is no centralized location in the file system to implement something like tiering, where I want metadata to go one in one single place rather than somewhere else. So those kind of policies, implementing policies, was very difficult in IFS v1. In v2, what we did was we actually rewrote our whole allocation engine and replaced it by a one single allocator. And that allocator, we massively optimized it to the point where it could do like 150,000 allocations per second and sustain it. Um, and it could do it in parallel. So literally, you can have like 50, 60 threads active in the allocator with e at the same time, allocating from the same region. And they always use, they use uh, interlock test and set bits to essentially you know to synchronize among each other. None of the, they will never take any locks to do that. Now, what that also allowed us to do is now each one of those allocation requests now it allowed REFS to, allow, to implement policies based on the type of request that was. And I'll explain a bit later um, how it helped us to solve the SMR problem. So these are the, some of the top-level features of REFS v2. And oh, there are many more, but I focused on things that helped us uh, in the SMR world. Um, so as you know, this is just a small primer on SMR. So there are three kinds of SMR drives. So here I'm talking about host managed SMR, the no native SMRs. So where the if you don't send writes in the proper serialized order, you will actually the drive will fail that IO. And when we started the project, we had a first party customer in mind, and they gave us very strict requirements for for what they expect from us. So today their application runs on NTFS on normal drives. So at least for V1, they wanted that application to be running on REFS SMR without any change and without any performance reg regression. Yes, they, it, it, it was OK for them not to get any extra advantage, but there is no, uh, no performance degradation was acceptable. <laughs> and also their requirement was, multiple files will be written simultaneously. So you cannot, we cannot assume that only one file is getting written. So multiple, we'll say IOs from multiple files and multiple directories happening. Now, this application also did mostly serialized writes, but not entirely. So, so it's kind of interesting, because I told, I told you about strict uh, because we are using host managed SMR. So it doesn't matter if 99.9% .9 of my IOs are serialized, if one of them is an overwrite, it will fail, right? So here's the interesting thing is, yes, a large majority of the IOs were sequential, but, but not 100%. And yes, they, they can remove that from the application, but we had to handle it anyway. And then another requirement was the fact that if you look at the uh, fact that they also want a serialized IO throughput to disk. Now, in a rotational media like uh, normal disks, you'll be surprised how much variance there is to throughput that you can get based on if you do random writes versus if you do serialized write, as well as if you do serialized write with Q depth more than one. They're hugely, hugely different. 
variance is not like 10 or 20 percent, like 50, 60, 70 percent difference sometimes. And they wanted serialized multi, multi-thread I/O onto the disk, and it has to be somehow RFS, the file system has to manage all of it while they're doing random I/Os on top. And then the last one was even more interesting. So even though they have a very high requirement of write throughput, and it's, this is a write-heavy workload, they had a very strong SLA on reads. Reads are not that often, but when reads come, file system has to drop everything, stop everything, and let the reads through. So in other words, it doesn't matter what the file system is doing, it has to be able to, it has to be under the control of the application. Application can say, stop, I need to let a read through, and, and because the reads have, have strict SLA requirements. Um, so, okay. So, remember I said we replaced all of our multitude of allocation, allocators using one single allocator? And what that enabled us to do was essentially do policy-driven allocation. So the policies are essentially based on the type of allocation that we're getting. Will There's a small amount of policy module that gets attached to that allocation request, and it will essentially guide the allocator to say, allocate, try to find free space from this region on the volume rather than this. And it can actually, depending on the situation, it can also set strict boundaries, saying that only allocate from here, don't ever stray from this. And it became very important in, SM, in SMR support because there's some amount of, for example, we could never let our metadata bleed into a SMR, SMR region on the disk. So also the same thing was we had tiering our allocations, so we knew that what type of media we're dealing with. So if it's SMR, it's, it's CMR, or if it is uh, SSD, flash, all of it. Now, <laughs> the last one is very interesting. Now, if you think about it, one of the major problems of supporting SMR in, in file system is I create a bunch of files, set EOF, which essentially gives you the allocations. And in fact, all of the file system will give you actual LCNs. Um, and so they are essentially being allocated at the time the file creation or set EOF. But that's not the time when the files are getting written. And that causes a huge problem with SMR because let's say I, I allocate half of a band to one file, half of a band to the other file. Now the first file doesn't get written, the second file gets written. What do you do? So REFS has a very interesting allocation logic where we essentially can allocate without assigning LCNs. So what happens is, because we have a very strong forward progress engine that we needed, a copy and write, uh, so copy and write allocation engine requires a forward progress of where we can track at a cluster granularity exactly how much of the volume is free. We know exactly how much of the volume is, has been spoken for, how much of it is free pending, and all of those. So using that logic, we extended that logic to essentially do allocation. So what happens is that when you set EOF and ask for allocation, all you get is a token. So the file system actually stores that token in the run table of the file, and then when the IO comes along, it essentially goes to the allocator and says, now allocate me LCNs based on the token you gave me. And because the token is essentially a reservation, the file system at that, or sorry, the allocator at that point goes and finds the LCNs, and the, the IO code path will now update the run table of the file to reflect those LCNs and then send the IO to the disk. And all of it gets persisted. Sure. I'm not familiar with the term LCN. Oh, so it's called LCNs are logical cluster numbers. So when you see a volume, it's essentially the clusters, it's, it's the flat namespace of a volume. It's called, and we break it down in in cluster granularity. It's very interesting. We call the same thing CDDF or VDDF, volume block. Yeah, that's, that's the same thing. That's, that's what same. I thought you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. We, we call it LCN, logical cluster number. So, okay. So now you understand why that was very important for SMR because we could not actually give real LCN allocation while somebody said, oh, said EOF to something. So 
another feature of RDS v, RDFS v2 is even more interesting. So if you think about a file system, file system gives a hierarchical file and directory namespace on top of the volume namespace. What RDFS v2 did was it added a logical indirection layer between them. So what we did was we essentially broke that flat namespace in 64 or 256 MB chunks, and each one of those chunks essentially created a virtual namespace on top. Now all of the rest of the file system actually uses the virtual namespace. Now interestingly, what that allowed us to do is, now uh, before I continue, um, interestingly what we found out, when does uh, any part of the file system need to know where your, your data is actually residing? It's actually a very, very small time when you are reading or writing, right? So all we need did, did was essentially that layer of mapping from top to bottom. We, so anybody doing read and write will take a shared log to make sure that mapping is not changing as is IO is pending. And that's pretty much it. So what it enabled us to do was this layer, we could, we could read a 64 MB chunk or 256 MB chunk of, of, uh, of the space, of, of the disk, move it into another 64 MB chunk and just swap the pointers. And none of the, none of the top layers of the file system ever knew that that had happened. And this is how we do dynamic tearing. Remember I said we allocate on the IO code path where we put into the first year. Now we fill up the first year. How do you get, now some of that hot data now becomes cold. How do you move them efficiently, now your new cold data, from the hot tier to the slow tier? Yes, you, you have, if you grovel through the file system namespace in 64 MB chunks, for example, there might be 16,000 files in it. You have to go and update all of their metadata. That wasn't, will never scale. So this allowed us to just read, one read, one write, a few updates. Uh, to a uh, table, done. So, so you have the ingestion code path as well as the code path which moves things out from the heart to the code. And of course, sometimes you need to move from cold to the heart in some other situations. The same, same rule applies. So this is what allowed us to do uh, dynamic tiering, um, and it's REF, and it's in V2, 2016. Now, for SMR, we actually taught this layer a few additional tricks. Now what, so we call it compaction. It'll, it'll very easily understand why this is needed very soon. You can have a band, or, or this cluster band, having written, and now it has got holes in them. Because some of the files that, that were written, they got deleted. Unfortunately for normal, so for, if it was normal media, I could have just filled in those holes, right? But SMR, you cannot do that, right? In fact, if you reset the right head, you will actually have a data corruption. So what we can do is we can take, read this, the semi-allocated band on the left, and using another index and stuff, I can write it sequentially, only the valid bits, to some other band. So I can take like five bands, which are 20% full, and compact them into one single band. Now I've got four bands, which are com now completely free. So when we did this work, we also did add it. So when you're saying, if we are compacting like that, why can't we compress it? So that's another feature that REFS V2 has. Um, so, so we can compress it, and these are the four compression algorithms that we support. Oh, sorry, any questions? Or, it looks surprisingly familiar. Yeah, yeah it should. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, uh, I guess on copy and write file systems, you yeah. have to solve the same yeah. problems. Yeah. So now on to this. So these are the features of REFS, core REFS, that, and we extended some of the features to help us solve the SMR problem. Now, this is what an SMR disk or volume looks like at the file system level. So using spaces, I know, are you familiar with the spaces technology of, uh, from Microsoft? 
which essentially is a software uh, storage management layer where it can take physical disks and create the, like RAID 5 disk, RAID 6 disk, tiered volumes, all of it. So there's like you can think of a software storage management uh, layer. So it's block level. <clears throat> so what what we do is we use we use the spaces layer to create as a tiered volume. And with small amount of SSD tier and the rest, the whole spindle as the SMR tier. And remember I said, I talked about policy driven allocation. One of the things that we do here in this mode is we have a policy engine and allocation, allocator logic which says if I've got any metadata allocation, it should strictly be on the SSD tier. It should never ever bleed into the SMR tier. And then for data allocations, it is the opposite. It's saying it should never bleed into, into the SSD tier. It should always be in the SMR tier. But we go one step further. Remember one of the requirements we had was to give serialized IO, IO throughput. What it means is if I've got multiple files writing at the same time, all of their allocations technically should be serialized in the LCN namespace. That's the only way by which you can get high throughput. So even though I might have 100 writable bands, I cannot scatter their data over the 100 bands because ultimately there's a disk head which will move around and the performance won't be good. So the SMR policy engine or data policy engine in this board will essentially not only, it will only give its, you see that active SMR band is that band that's currently getting written. So we'll give the policy engine saying, just allocate, allocate or just find free LCNs from here. So I think that's pretty much what I've already said. So all metadata goes into flash, all data in SMR, using deferred allocation logic, and small IOs from multiple different bands, uh, multiple different files get serialized into a single band. Now, this is the next set of problems you have to solve. Now, let's say five, ten files are getting written at the same time. They go to the allocator, they get serialized allocations. That's fine. Now, because these are five different threads, we don't control scheduling, right? So what can happen is by the time they actually send the IOs to the, to the device down below, they have got out of order. And because we have a st very strict requirement of, because these are native SMR drives, they have a strict sequential, sequentiality requirement or else things, um, IOs are gonna fail. So what we do is because the cluster band maps one-to-one -one with the SMR zone, we added some logic inside that cluster band metadata to, to track the right head of that band. So today what we do is, any IO after the allocation, uh, after, the, after the goes to the allocator gets some LCNs, now it checks with the cluster band, saying am I at the head of the band? If not, it will wait for, some of, for the other people to catch up. Now interestingly, the guy who is at the head, he acquires, he acquires a certain interlock lock and sends the IO down. Now we actually change the, and technically, uh, um, let me rephrase this a bit. Now technically, when is it legal to send down the next IO? Of course, one trivial solution will be when the first IO, the IO that's down on the stack completes, you send down the next IO. But that will actually make the queue depth one, and which is not good for performance. So what we did was we actually changed the port driver at um, the, the port driver software to essentially give us a guarantee that when, when that IO is sequentially queued to the hardware, tell us that, give us an indication, we are going to send down the next IO. So using that mechanism, we can actually like the, pump the uh, the engine to like having 20, 30, or 29 IOs pending at any one point. So we get serialized IO performance. <clears throat> so how am I doing on time? Sorry. 
I have just five minutes? Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, let me just. So, uh, as I said, so SMR bands get written serially, but deletes are random. Now you have got holes in them, and we use the garbage collection logic, uh, the compaction logic to do, do the garbage collection, which is, simple, which is in, uh, pretty self explanatory. But the problem with the garbage collection was the fact that it needed to read 256 MB and write whatever was valid in there. Now, writing 256 MB, reading 256 MB, and then writing whatever is valid will actually um, is a long operation on a rotational media. So, oh, yeah. um, it's a long operation. Remember, we said that there is a we had a very strict SLR requirement on on reads. So if a read comes along when this garbage collection write is happening, it will break the SLA. So to solve the problem, so we essentially let the application drive when to do the garbage collection. So this is the way it works. At any point of time, we know how much amount of free space we have in the SSD tier, SMR tier, how much of our SMR tier actually requires garbage collection. And all of that information is available to the application through a file system control uh, call. When the, when the application knows that, OK, I have some amount of time where I won't be using the disk, it will actually call us through another separate FSCTL to start garbage collecting. And the garbage collection will continue till there is nothing to garbage collect, or the application tells us to stop. And, and because of, uh, so on top of that, so we have to honor that. On top of that, the application also dictates what is the IO granularity that we are allowed to send down even during garbage collection. So for example, if you have to read 256 MB, if I send down 256 MB, there's no way to cancel that IO if a read comes along. So what they do is the application editor tells us that, by the way, do it at, let's say, 1 MB granularity. So we will send down 1 MB IOs 256 MB times, and each time we'll check if it is uh, canceled or not, and to immediately uh, Exactly. Sure. I don't understand the right latency on that. So it's sending one megabyte at a time. Yes. Yeah. No, so you have a buffer. So we have a buffer. We allocate a 256 MB buffer, but we are populating it by sending it one MB IOs at a time. Instead of sending a 256 MB IO to the device driver and tell me, give me all the data. But it's not durable on that. Oh, no, it's not. So yeah, it's, it's in memory. So, so there is some amount of GC overhead concerns. Like for example, if you think about it, if we did this for every single um, file in the system, like every single band will actually ultimately require garbage collection. So one of the things we, we do today uh, is essentially the file is large enough, means greater than the band size, we allocate a full band to the file. So that way, uh, at least, uh, some amount of garbage collection. So when the file gets deleted, the whole band becomes free. So some amount of the garbage collection overhead won't be that high. In fact, uh, in the workload that's currently targeted for for our EFS, 90% um, of our data set is bigger than um, bigger than uh, 256 MB. It's only actually 10% of our data set that requires garbage collection, which will steal approximately 10, 20% of the IOPS. The system because in in this kind of system there is no downtime. The system is almost the volume is almost ninety percent plus full, and it's doing IOs constantly. So it's saying that oh we'll we'll defer it for the for the for the, for yeah um, quiet times is not an option. It has to be accounted for upfront. So we actually have to go through the data set and the IO pattern of the application and figure out what will be the garbage collection overhead system. So, what does it all mean? So let's see. I actually have a demo of uh, IO load generated. It is actually simulating the exact write pattern IO load 
of the application that will the production application this machine has one single smr spindle just one so these are one of our test machines it has got on a tiered volume i don't know if it's readable or not it has a 12 terabyte smr tier 26 gb which is 0.2 percent uh, ssd tier and and the workload generator is essentially opening multiple files and just writing one MBIOS to it. And you'll see what throughput we get on this. And this is, remember, this is one single spindle. <coughs> Oops, sorry. How do I enable this? Okay. So as you can see, you see the files? So this is resource monitor. So there are actually 100 files to which the application is writing data, one MB writes. This is the throughput in megabytes. This is the throughput that the, uh, that the application is getting in megabytes from one single spindle. And I don't know if this is observable or not, this is the queue depth on the device of how many number of pending IOs there are. It's actually 50. And the 50 is not because of REFS. Good. Uh, not because of REFS, it's because the application, the, the IO load generator, refuses to have more than 50 IOs pending at a time uh, on, on the file system. Um, <coughs> What's happening in the gaps? Pardon? Oh, okay. <laughs> so remember, he's, we are getting 200 Mbps throughput. Every single second, almost every single second, we are just switching to a new band. That's one. But that's not the reason for the gap. <laughs> the weird part of this is this Apple, the uh, IO, I'm sorry, the load generator is actually doing overwrites of the file. So it's essentially, even though it's not supposed to, that's not what we ex expect from the application, but the load generator actually writes to the file once, writes to it again, writes to it, to it again. So what it requires us to do is every time it does a 1MB IO, we actually have to free it. So that causes a bit of metadata churn, which is, I think, what those times where we are flushing our metadata. But still, based on the throughput, end-to-end -end throughput, it doesn't show up. It just shows up over here yeah. as a you're talking about this yeah. yeah this is this is where we need to flush because of the fact because the way the load generator is working is essentially because it's doing overrides we have to do a free we have to run our free pipeline in response to it Oh, that's mostly shit. This is one single machine with, with some amount of, I guess, randomness in there. Oh, so this is where most probably we ran a bit of a checkpoint, checkpoint in between, because freeze also have to trigger. The artifacts of the client, not the drive. This is the artifact, yeah. So this is the artifact of, of the file system in, in there. But for every five seconds, it essentially is measuring how much IOPS it gets or how much throughput it's still getting 210 Mbps on a single spindle right throughput. So, so this is another now Yeah, so the, so, yeah, so as I said, compaction is garbage collection, right? Yes. So what will happen is that, so it's scheduled by the application. So the application will say, okay, now do garbage collection. So, so there, uh, there actually today, I think we send down IOs one at a time because one of the things that we cannot do is essentially send them like 50 or 60 of, the, of them on, onto the device and then we get an abort call and there's no way to take those things back. So we prefer to be slow in that rather than do it, try to do it fast and then then uh, break the SLA of a read. Another question is, you said the, 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 the,
Yes, so this is actually on the on on the port driver. That's number of pending IOs that are currently pending. On the driver. On the driver. So on the drive, because I I I don't have the mechanism to know that, but I know uh, a Western Digital Engineer actually put the probes in there. So in this kind of workload, it was 29. <coughs> so there are 29 one MB pending IOs on your hard disk device. Yeah, so it's it's essentially is happening because of the fact that it's the same free because the this load generator is doing overwrites, even though it gets the same performance. The thing is that because it's generating all this freeze, the freeze have to be persisted in our in our global metadata engine. So that once in a while we have to take, but but because it's it's a bug in the load generator. Um, so once they fix the load generator, we shouldn't see that. So a checkpoint is like a self. Yes. yes. And, and you try to, you normally try to defer that? Yes, we, we, we do it only when there is enough amount of dirty metadata in the system to justify a checkpoint. Now, because we have got right head logging, we are essentially, if you have got right through on some other operations, we can log it. We don't need to write it. Oh, uh, you get the you same. Do a partial recovery is what I'm wondering. No, you get the same right through consistency. So if if all of these operations happen and it crashes, okay, I think I'm just out of time. It crashes. Let's take this offline. Let's. Okay, I'll Oh, uh, you heard. We do one zone at a time. Yes, well, keep on doing it. No, so that will go one by one. So five zones, what will happen is that it will take one of the zones, take its data, put it in uh, another target zone. Then it will read the next zone, put its data into the next zone. It does one by one. The reason we could have done it more parallel, but again, we have a very strict requirement, the SLA on the reads. And because of that, we made sure that any time the reads take direct precedence when they come. They are rare. Yes. So as of now, we, we haven't done that optimization. Yes, we can technically could have gotten it from that cache that is we are reading, but today I think our code path will uh, send it down. Um, to be honest, the read, before the read hits, the application <coughs> above will actually abort the uh, garbage collection and then send down the read. So read tech, Excuse me. Read technically cannot happen while while garbage collection is going on in the system because it's depending on the applica the application that, that we are targeting. Yes. So we never explicitly open a zone. It's all implicit open. Uh, today we, for all practical purposes, for writing, we essentially are writing to one single zone. Otherwise, you don't get the performance. So even though there can be 128 open zones, we technically right to one zone. <laughs> um, that's a good question. So it'll be a, I'm the file system person from the top. So this is a question for the people who handle the block, uh, block driver. They'll know for sure, but I think the answer is yes. Sure. Yes. No, we cannot. We thought about using it. The reason we cannot use it is because of performance. Remember, that 210 Mbps threshold uh, throughput, you'll never get if your head moves even once. So it, it drops like crazy. It's like, it'll become like 50 MB. So because of that. Uh, yes, all metadata, every single amount of metadata goes into the SSD layer. And what happens, the metadata overhead of the whole system is 0.1 percentage of the data. So as you can see, we, we configured with 12 terabyte, one single spindle, 12 terabyte and only 26 GB of uh, SSD. And we know that this is the maximum overhead that ever will be, the volume will take. So. Okay. Um, 
more questions. Thank you.